Um, thank you. So first let me begin by thanking the organisers because it's really been an incredible opportunity to round off a discussion with an important gathering like this. And the more we can bring you on uh, board to where we are and what the great opportunities are of 2015, the better for us. We certainly need more champions and this is a huge agenda. Um, it is the last mile. David and, and I and Masharia and, and other key, the Secretary General, will be hoping we get to September in one piece. Um, but it will be for a good cause, so I think we're, we're ready. We're ready for that, but I'm really happy to be here today. Over the last two years as a special advisor on post-2015, um, I have been supporting various streams of work, and coming on in the beginning, we really didn't know what the end would look like, and many said to us, three years, goodness, do you need that long? We'll talk to you in 2015, and you're on your own for the next two years. But I think um, when you listen to what I have to say now, you'll know that two years is almost a short time to have done what member states have put forward for us to, to negotiate in this, in, this last, in this last mile, but certainly helping member states to define a new development agenda. I think one thing that remains clear and has resonated above all is that we have before us a unique opportunity for a paradigm shift in international development. It's an opportunity to deliver on decades of promises and efforts and to put the world on a much more sustainable path to ensure a life of dignity for all. The opportunity of 2015, and we keep underscoring this is a year where um, whatever we miss, it's not that it won't come again, but when it does, the implications of the expense of it, the retrofit that will not be possible um, will be one that we would have regretted, and so we really need to be engaged in doing this. As the UN celebrates 70 years of existence, 2015 offers a unique opportunity for global leaders and people to continue to combat poverty and injustice through accelerating the progress on the MDGs, we have a real chance to set the world on a path to a universal, transformative, and integrated agenda. The world has changed markedly since the inception of the UN. However, more than ever, the three interconnected pillars of our work, development, peace, and human rights, continue to form the foundation of our responses to existing, emerging, and new challenges that the world faces on a daily basis. 2015 is the year for global action, and today we began with Action 2015 with our 15-year-olds, um, who will be in a, in a position in 2030 to tell us how we have succeeded. There are three key milestones, however, this year that will shape the sustainable development agenda and determine the fate of the world over the next, 30, over the next 15 years and beyond. They include the Financing for Development Conference in July, the Special Summit for Sustainable Development to launch the post-2015 development agenda in September, and the Conference of the Parties, COP21, in December, which will seal a new deal on climate change. While these meetings stem from separate processes, their agendas are mutually reinforcing and will need to be coordinated. These three components are the three legs of the post-2015 sustainable development agenda. The three high-level international meetings in Addis Ababa, New York, and Paris in the year ahead give us quite an opportunity to chart a new era of sustainable development. Never before have we had a world uh, with a unique opportunity to address such a complex agenda in one year. This won't come again, I believe, in our generation. The 2015 global leaders, governments, businesses, and people can finally agree to transform the world to end poverty better meet human needs and the necessities of economic transformation, protecting our environment and tackling climate change. Our ambition is to achieve sustainable development for all. In terms of the substance of the post-2015 development agenda, as you know, the international community has discussed the post-2015 development agenda since the Rio conference in 2012. Much has been achieved in the last two years. A clear consensus has emerged for one, on a coherent agenda centred on sustainable development and with poverty eradication as its most urgent priority. As a key member of the Open Working Group, Ireland joined other member states of the United Nations to embark on more than a year of inclusive and intensive deliberations, which emerged with the 17 specific goals that we see and 169 associated targets as the proposed set of sustainable development goals. In addition to reinforcing the commitment to the unfinished business of the MDGs, the proposed SDGs have broken new ground with goals on inequalities, economic growth, decent jobs, energy, climate change, sustainable consumption and production, 
as well as what is new and important, peace, justice, and strengthening of institutions. These are all essential issues that will speak to the priorities of citizens and people around the world. Throughout these negotiations and its policy for international development, one world, one future, Ireland has made its priorities clear. Food security and nutrition, gender equality, women's empowerment, environment and climate change, and the sustainable de development needs of small island developing states. I'm pleased to confirm that these priorities figure high on the agenda that we have now that has come out of the Open Working Group. The synthesis report of the Secretary General has been another important milestone for us at the end of last year. At the request of member states, the Secretary General was asked to provide a key input into the post-2015 debate with the synthesis report. Its overarching message is that we need a new universal compact, one that is people-centred and planet-sensitive. Sustainable development is at the centre of the post-2015 development agenda, and poverty eradication, as I've said, is its highest priority. And we hope that we will continue the path of the MDGs, the unfinished business, and hope to solidify their achievements and fill their gaps. We see this in the emerging sustainable development goals. The structure of the synthesis report reflects the four main elements that are needed if we are to arrive at an ambitious and transformative agreement in September. An inspirational narrative that reflects all the inputs, a framework of goals to make that narrative operational, the means of implementation, financial and non-financial, for the agenda, and a framework for shared responsibility to ensure that the promises that we make to people are delivered. The report strongly reinforces universality and integration as an essential basis for the new agenda. It includes throughout the framework, across and within each of the proposed sustainable development goals. While welcoming the work of the Open Working Group, the report offers six essential elements to help frame and reinforce the sustainable development agenda and ensure that the ambition and vision expressed by member states communicates and is delivered at country level. And this was an important part of the work because the tensions of having so many goals and targets was one that was addressed by both sides of the floor. And I think we are all conscious that what we bring down to the country level in a political agenda has to communicate and be that that countries can carry and um, integrate into their own visions and plans. And so with that, the six essential elements that we put forward were dignity, people, planet, shared prosperity, justice and partnership. The six elements are meant to inspire member states and all stakeholders in their efforts to agree on a transformative and communicable sustainable development agenda. Again here, underscoring that we do want to transform societies. This is not something that we're adding on um, to an agenda, but that it's an integral part of countries' transformations. And we do want to communicate it. There are different stakeholders, many new players um, to this development agenda. In terms of the implementation, monitoring and finance, implementation will be the litmus test of this agenda and will require serious financial commitment and other means of implementation, such as adequate mechanisms to take full advantage of new technologies and their possible applications to sustainable development challenges. Sustainable development is a complex agenda and the means to finance its imperatives will not be found in one solution nor will they be borne by one set of actors. In fact, all resources, public, private, national and international, will need to be tapped into. <coughs> the synthesis report has identified a number of concrete recommendations for financing the sustainable agenda. It does so by building heavily on the work of member states through the Intergovernmental Committee of Experts on Sustainable Development Finance. But it goes beyond that. The aim of the Secretary General was not to present options for compromise, but rather to maintain the highest possible level of ambition throughout the agenda. First, the report underscores the importance of delivering on the existing ODA commitments. These represent the foundation of the multilateral system, and delivering on them is a moral responsibility that is long overdue. Aligning development finance and climate finance, whilst honouring existing ODA commitments, will be essential, as will be the need to continue to provide substantial debt relief for poor countries. And, and recently, we've actually seen debt relief being discussed uh, for the three countries that have suffered the crisis of Ebola. 
Second, the report highlights the importance of mobilising domestic resources to fund the agenda. I think over time it's been underestimated actually how much domestic resources have played a part in supporting the MDGs. And uh, while we've appreciated what ODA has done for it, domestic resources will continue to remain uh, that that will sustain the gains that we've made with those investments. It is the most important, not only in terms of the volumes that are required, but also to ensure countries' ownership of the agenda and full control over its implementation. So we're not looking, again, to add on to a budget. We're looking to be an integral part of the budget um, process and the resources that come from, domestic, uh, from the domestic uh, purse. Third, the report highlights the need to look at private source, sources of financing, both within and across national borders. Urgent action is still needed to mobilize, redirect, and unlock the transformative power of trillions of dollars in private resources for sustainable development, and have these channeled with long-term returns. The result in Addis, therefore, where a compact for a global partnership may be re realized, will be crucial. In fact, I know that David's challenge will be that the outcomes from, from uh, Addis Ababa in July, if they don't meet the expectations of the sustainable development agenda, we then will have a crisis on our hands as to how to produce a whole um, in September. These are indeed high expectations for concrete outcomes that would finance the whole of the agenda, but also set a stage for a successful outcome of the COP21 in Paris to see that they are mutually reinforcing and what we do um, in September will have um, a positive or otherwise impact on um, the uh, climate change agenda. So we look to the continued leadership in Ireland in the financing process. This is something that has already begun in terms of its negotiations and we know that it is a tall hill uh, to climb but, but certainly one that has to be done. For implementation and monitoring that includes all stakeholders, we will need a data revolution for the sustainable development agenda. It will be important because it will be critical to support accountability and it will be the lifeblood of participatory decision making. The process so far has engaged all key stakeholders and we hope that it continues to do so to the end. But it will be more than just the September conclusion. We will have 15 years in which we will have to find a common understanding of how we hold governments responsible to delivering on the agenda and so therefore the data revolution will be key. Lastly, business as usual, as Mary had often told us yesterday, is no longer possible. There is a strong consensus on the need for a strengthened global partnership for the implementation of the new development agenda and a partnership that should be equitable, inclusive, with mutual accountability and a fair sharing of responsibilities. All people, citizens, civil society, responsible businesses, local authorities sub-national and national governments, parliaments, regional organisations, global institutions and the scientific and academic communities all have an essential and leading role to play in this transformation. This may be through discussions and consultations that have been happening at the local and international levels, but much more so in the, in the indicators and the measures that we will choose to hold governments accountable. Expectations of the intergovernmental negotiations and the role that we really um, expect in leadership from Ireland. The role of Ireland as co-chairs of the intergovernmental negotiations on the post-2015 uh, development agenda cannot be underscored. It has been an incredible opportunity for us to engage in our partnership in the UN with Ireland right from the presidency of the EU, where in fact the difficult discussions of bringing together development and environment were our major challenge. And at that point in time, it was almost as though the commissions could not bring themselves together. But the position that came under your leadership actually set the, the tone for agreeing that this agenda would be universal and that it would be about sustainable development. What had been spoken about for decades would finally come of its time. But at this moment, let me applaud the excellent working relationship that we have with Ambassador David Donoghue and the Secretary General, and in, indeed across the entire UN system. It's not just seeing him as the co-facilitator, which I think is sort of the trouble you get for all the work that you did with us, David, <laughs> in making it possible um, for us to come out with um, a, an open working group agreement that would facilitate an ambitious agenda in September. This is the final lap as we agree on a transformative sustainable development agenda. The greatest challenge in the year ahead will be to maintain the ambition and momentum demonstrated so far as member states finalise the future framework. 
the SDGs are the result of a thorough intergovernmental process that for the first time, and we must not underestimate this, have resulted in a joint, universal, and human rights-based vision of humanity for 2030. This is a unique and very significant result to get 193 persons who are representing member states um, in New York to agree on this was, was quite phenomenal. That said, the goals must be communicable and the targets measurable. As member states embark on the negotiations of the final declaration in September, the UN stands, of course, ready to assist in any further adjustments that they may choose to make. And this comes through in the Secretary General's uh, synthesis report where he does make those suggestions that we can go further, refine the targets, make more communicable the goals. While the UN system will continue to provide its support, the transition from the MDGs to the post-2015 era will require strong political leadership, and we're confident that you will rise up to this important challenge here in Ireland. Um, and nonetheless, one has to, I think, underscore that the success of your development agenda, the Irish aid development um, work that's being done in our countries, is an example of how we can accelerate uh, finishing off the MDGs, but also a powerful way of communicating and leading in the transition, which will be um, a big challenge for many countries. This is a change in narratives, a change in the way we do things. And I think uh, it is those that they trust to deliver that they will be looking to in this transition. Ireland's played a critical role in the process that has led to this important year, and we look forward to this continued leadership um, of this great nation to enable us use the collective um, opportunities that are before us. And I certainly was um, greatly enthused and um, humbled at the meeting that I had with the President this afternoon. It was an incredible opportunity to see that he not only spoke to the technical and the political side of this, but philosophically, conceptually, and the narrative for this he reinforced with what has to be done. So we are certainly counting on him when uh, David Masharia, the Secretary General, myself, have fast run out of all the energy that we have and the wherewithal to move 193 people to cross the line, it is uh, leaders like that that we will need to come along and say, well, wake up and smell the roses. This is the way you go. And I think he will do that. Um, my my uh, uh, interaction with him this afternoon certainly gave us uh, great hope. Um, your active engagement will continue to contribute to the ongoing efforts, um, ensuring that the world delivers a sustainable development. As I said earlier today, my meetings twice now with civil society in Ireland um, they are extremely proactive. I think that this is a great sign of not waiting to be asked, but actually demanding rights that leaders have to put on the table for a universal agenda. And so we continue to uh, um, look forward to you holding the United Nations member states and the system itself feet to the fire that we get the best agenda possible. We don't negotiate the ambition out of it. Um, so at this point, let me thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to the interaction that we have after. Thank you. Thank you.